today? Awesome! I'm hearing earth sounding good as well. All right, Kai, take with me your hymns and stand as we turn to hymn number 43. Hymn number 43, crown him with many crowns. Stand with me as we sing, crown him with many crowns. Number 43. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. And thou the heavenly anthem drowns, oh music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. And hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, a goodly garrified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. It's exciting day to be here, Lord, in your house, listening to a message that you have prepared for us today. I pray that you may open our hearts, and that we may let ourselves be open to conviction and, and to instruction, Lord. I thank you for everything that you do for us and all the little tiny blessings that you present us each and every day. I pray that you may help us to never forget what you've done for us, what you continue to do and what you will do for us, Lord. I pray that you may help us to have a wonderful service today and that we may continue to have a smile on our face. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, everyone stay standing. Turn your hymns to page number 279, 279 in the garden. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I've misplaced the itinerary. I think it's over on the, the page over there. Yes, so if you could help me bring that up over here as we sing In the Garden, 279. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever
what he bids me go through the voice of love his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy Tarry there, none other has ever known. Amazing, everybody. You may be seated as we make way for our weekly announcements. Uh, first of all, thanks for all being here. May God bless you all. For our young brother and sister here, welcome. Nice to have you here. It's a long way to come for one service. But thanks for coming. I appreciate it. God bless you. Um, yeah. The, uh, the service today, pretty standard, the same as before. Youth Connect by Brother Lawrence here. I'll be later on. And all have fellowship. Teas and coffees are provided. It's all free. Just enjoy yourself. Have a chit chat. I'm glad you glad, glad you all can make it today. Um, on Wednesday, there's an evening Bible study in this hall at seven o'clock. We had one last week. Very enjoyable. Uh, pastor was speaking about Esther. Yeah, very good. Um, you know, further week. So on the 22nd, we're going to start evening services in here. Uh, 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. More than welcome. Come along. And then on the Saturday the 28th, we're going to uh, have what they call a youth scavenger hunt and uh, connect. Speak to Dina for details about it. It's a youth thing, and I'm no longer youth. Sorry about that. Uh, but on the 29th, we have Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence, he is sitting here. As uh, ordination for a deacon. Congratulations, brother. Brother Lawrence, brother Stephen. Sorry. <laughs> Congratulations. Give a hand there. Come on, come on. Congratulations. I'm saying brother Lawrence. And also, on Sunday the 5th, we have a baptism service uh, down at the River Dee. I have been speaking to the, uh, the people who are in charge of the Bothy, and we have been given permission. We can use their Bothy for changing purposes. Uh, last time I went and the change in tent just blew away. This time, this time it's not going to happen. Uh, on the Thursday the 16th we have a men's camp and contact the pastor and it's done by brother uh, Pastor Don Clough at uh, Falkaba. Uh, spending three nights away for your wife's. May not be a bad idea. I spent four weeks away from mine and I must have to be honest. Um, yes, I did. Uh, on a 24th to 20th of July, I know it's a long way away, but we're having friends, brothers come across from America, uh, neighbourhood Bible time, and Pastor Rick is dealing with that. And then in the autumn, we have a ladies' Bible study, and Pastor's wife, Sarah Damastis, will be taking that. Uh, finishing off uh, the usual standard weekly poem, uh, and it's called In God So Loved. In God So Loved, not just you and me, not just the people that we see, but all our neighbours, enemies, and the rest, our loved ones, family, give them your best. For he gave his son to that cross and died to show us his love and was crucified. And in our Bible, we are told that after three days, the stone was rolled. He arose and showed us all that he could not hold him, not at all. He sacrificed his blood for a sinful land and fixed up the Son of Man. But by giving his life for you and me, your Saviour, and he'll forgive your sins and correct your behaviour. Then heaven awaits for, our, for your redemption. Your sins are gone, and there's no exception. The gates will be open 
when he calls with open arms he saved us all Amen, thank you And everybody stand with me as we turn to hymn number 335. Hymn 335, He is able to deliver thee. Hymn 335. done everyone you may be seated now I know it says in the bulletin dismiss the children for Sunday school but we've already done that uh, oh, we're gonna skip right past that and go into the scripture reading it's gonna be 1st Corinthians chapter 2 uh, verse 1 through the whole thing actually the entirety of chapter 2 and it will be spoken by brother Stephen Isa so if he may come up and speak 1st Corinthians chapter 2 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech of, or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not in the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak in the wisdom of God, mystery, even in the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world was unto our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they had known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither had he entered the heart of men, that the things which God had prepared for them that love him, but God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searched all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the thing of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even to the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. But who have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given unto us. Which things also we speak, not in the words which men, which man's wisdom teacheth, but the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural mind receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually descended. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet himself is judge of no man. For who had known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we are all, but we all have the mind of Christ. Thank you. Amen. All right, you guys may stay seated this time. Turning to page number 385, He Hideth My Soul. Just about 50 hymns to the right of 335. 385, actually that's 50. Oh, I need to go back to math class. 385, He Hideth My Soul. everybody and putting away the hymnals right before we have a mess uh, the message with our special speaker here today we have a special song prepared for you
Services, uh, thankful for the choir and uh, the opportunity to do special songs, uh, so we're thankful for that. Well, we have a special speaker here today, um, Brother Stewart. He's from the States, from Oklahoma, and uh, he contacted me while I was uh, on in the States, actually, <laughs> while I was still on, uh, on uh, the furlough there. And uh, we got to talking on the phone, and he started talking about his trip and how his kids had provided for him to be able to come out here, and he wanted to make it special. He wanted to visit the churches while he was out there and, uh, and picked ours, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, but I wanted to come on out. We got to talking for a little bit. I was like, hey, you know, let me know when you come out here. I mean, we'd you know, like to hear you preach. I mean, you're a preacher, so we'd like to hear you preach. And uh, so uh, all said and done, I put on the wrong date. I had him for next week. And uh, I was anticipating him coming next week. And then I got an email three days ago stating that he was here and he's looking forward to being with us. So I quickly sent an email reply. I'm like, so that, that's this weekend, right? <laughs> Just double checking. So uh, I was around and I, I don't know I'm just one of those you can't get preachers these days I think is what you say brother Bill uh, and that's the case here in this situation no but we're so thankful that he's here today and that he's coming to speak with us uh, today so we're thankful for that uh, I do want to just put a couple prayer requests out there do pray for my daughter Jossie uh, she's got tonsillitis and uh, she's on penicillin right now she's been on it for the last uh, 48 hours or 24 48 hours and uh, things are starting to turn around so she's starting to do better but she's still weak today and uh, it just seems like it's up and down in our household when it comes to sickness. Uh, but do pray for her in a quick recovery. I know you know Jossie. She's lively. She's all over the place. And when she's sick, you know it because she doesn't want to do anything. Uh, so we do pray for her. And Sarah's there with the kids uh, at this time. So she's watching the live stream, tuning in. She would really love to be here and uh, to see everybody. And we're thankful that you're here. And we're thankful for your prayers uh, in that matter. We're thankful also for you know, Graham doing much better. We've been praying for him. And, uh, and the biopsy that was done here this uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, so we're uh, praying for his continued recovery. Pray for other doctor's appointments that he has here in the near future. Just pray for uh, this to, uh, to him to get some good news. And uh, that's what we're looking for. Or just some news. I think it's just all over the place. And you just want something to be told to you. Uh, be with those that are, uh, pray for those as well that are going on holiday. And uh, pray for them as they travel. And uh, I know every, uh, Marion is back uh, from holiday. You know, I don't know. Was it a work trip being with the grandkids? 
I don't know, uh, one of those things. She'll say it was a work trip, Brother Bill, so not to make you feel bad. Uh, no, but we're so thankful to see Mary again and uh, seeing everybody's face. It's a, it brings joy to my heart, and it brings joy to my heart when we pray for one another. And it's something very important. It's dear to my heart. Uh, whether they're uh, here, present, or absent, we pray for them. We care for them. Uh, they're on holiday. We pray for their traveling safety. I mean, we want them to be safe, and uh, we want them to have a, a joyous trip while they're away, and uh, we love them, they're family. And it's important that we pray for one another and care for one another and send a text. I mean, I, t I have to tell you, texts go a long way when you say praying for you. It means that you're really, you really, you know about what's happening in their life, and it's come, uh, it come to your attention that there's somebody important to you. Call Letting them know that you care about them is very important. We have special things that are happening here in the next few months, and we'd like to work together as a team as we come together as in this church work. Uh, so pray for those things. Pray for this New Testament distribution that we're putting out. You know, we put out another 400 yesterday, and uh, as we continue to do this, we have just uh, a few short weeks left to be able to get them all out there. So if you'd like to participate, be a part of that. Uh, we do it on, uh, we're doing it Thursday mornings now at 10 o'clock as well as uh, Saturdays at 12 o'clock. Come be a part of that and uh, getting uh, the gospel uh, and the word of God out in the community here in Scotland. We've already done 10,000. We've done 15,000. We're just completing this next uh, 5,000 here to get them out there. So come be a part of that. Uh, but at this time, we're going to have Brother Stewart. He's going to come and give us the word of God today. So have your Bibles open and in tune with the word of God. And uh, uh, we look forward to hearing what he has. Thank you, Brother Stewart. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Well, uh, as I was meeting uh, many of you this morning, uh, I was surprised at uh, uh, all the different accents that I heard. Uh, I mean, when I came to church in Scotland, I thought everybody would be speaking, speaking with a Scottish accent. And uh, I find here in this church uh, a picture of uh, a small one, but a picture of what heaven will be like when uh, we will have people from every tribe in every nation uh, all together gathering around the throne of our Heavenly Father. Uh, let's start with prayer. Father God, you are our great and awesome God. You're the creator of all that is. And though uh, scripture says uh, you created the sun and the moon, and, and then it, it says it, almost as if in passing, and oh, you created the stars also. Uh, no big deal for you. But Lord, uh, as we look at the expanse of your heavens, we see your beauty and your majesty. Uh, scripture tells us that the heavens declare your glory. And yet, Lord, of all of your creation, uh, the, the pinnacle, the top of your creation is man. Man whom you created, that you might have fellowship with him. That you might have fellowship with us. And so, Lord, as uh, we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to us. That you would tell our hearts what it is you want us to know from your word this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, if you will turn with me to uh, Philippians 3, starting in verse 8. Uh, I'm sorry, starting in verse 3. Now, I, the Bible I have here has rather small print, and uh, I need to tell you that early in the trip, uh, I lost a lens in one of my, in my favorite pair of glasses, so I'm having to revert to these. So this print is, is a little difficult for me to read. So if I stumble over a few things, it, it's not that I can't read, it's that I can't see. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start with verse 3 and we'll carry through to verse 11. Circumcised which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof trust in the flesh, I more <clears throat> circumcised the eighth day of the 
of the tribe of Benjamin. Concerning zeal persecuting the church, which gained my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do you count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. A comfortable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Father God, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would give me your words, that anything that comes from me would be quickly forgotten, but those things that come from you would be burned into our hearts. In Jesus' name. In Matthew chapter 5, there's a passage where it says in verse 3, I'm sorry, not verse 3. Let me find it. Uh, If anyone... Uh, compels you to carry their pack one mile, carry it two. Let me give you a little history behind this. During the time of Christ, there was a law that stated that a soldier, as he was traveling along, could require a young man to carry his pack for one mile. Now, let me assure you that these young Jewish men knew exactly how many steps one mile was. Though they had to carry, for fear of great retribution, if they did not, this soldier's pack for one mile, they were not going to carry it one step farther than that. The story is told of uh, a soldier who came in to a town someplace in Israel. And the young man seeing the soldier come into town all turned away, careful that he would not catch their eye. But one young man was a little bit slow, and the soldier caught his eye. His first thought was, I can turn away and run, but that would not be a good idea. And so the soldier motioned for him to come over, and reluctantly he went over there. Knew what he had. He picked up the and started carrying it. And they walked for a mile. And this young man is thinking, Lord, why, God, are you allowing these invaders to come into our country to abuse us when we are your people? But he remembered this teaching of Jesus that said, if your enemy compels you to carry his pack one mile, carry it for him too. He thought, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. And yet, Jesus said I should do this. So I will do it. So they get to what would be the end of a mile and the soldier stopped. And the boy kept going. And the soldier said, "Uh, just a minute, Uh, that's far enough. You carried it one mile. And the young man said, I know. I'd like to carry it another mile. And the soldier says, well, okay. And so they start walking along again. And the soldier says, now, why would you do this? 
And he says, here's a teacher here in Israel. His name is Jesus. And he told them to do this. So he tells him what he knows about Jesus. He goes on to say, you know, I have a boy at home. It's about your age. I've seen him for three years. I miss my son a lot. Tell me about your family. And the young boy tells him about his family. And they walk along and they're talking about their families and their lives. What is going on? At the end of the second mile, which is at the outskirts of town, the soldier says, that is quite enough. Thank you. And he takes his pack. As the soldier walks off. And he thinks, this teaching is amazing. The first mile I walked with this soldier was my enemy. The second mile, he was my friend. Who is this Jesus whose teaching changes lives? Who is this Christ who wants us to know him? Is he someone that we can know? Moses wanted to know him. In Exodus 33, 11 through 13, It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not from the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast sent, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if that I may know thee. John Sanders, a uh, great preacher from New Zealand, said, we may not know God as we want to know him, or we would like to know him, But we know God as much as we choose to know him. Paul wanted to know God. And we know God when we know Christ. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, And the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. 1030, he says, I and the Father are one. We're the same one. Colossians 2. It says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That word fullness means the completeness. All of God dwelled in Christ. Complete. 
Do you remember when uh, Christ made a special appearance to Timothy after his resurrection, before the ascension? And, and, and uh, the disciples said, I, mean, I think I got that place uh, mixed up, but, but they said, uh, show us the Father. And he said, have you known me so long and yet you do not recognize me? He said, I am the Father. I am God in the flesh. What an amazing thing that the God of this universe is someone that we can know deeply and personally. Paul said this. Let's go back to Ephesians, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, to Philippians 3, verses 8. Where Paul says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may have Christ. Everything else is just garbage compared to knowing Christ. If you think about your lives day to day, do you live your lives in such a way that Christ is at the center and the head of everything that you do? That he is the forefront of your thoughts? And all these other things are just things that we do as we exist in this world. But Christ is the center. Christ is our friend. Christ is our Father. Christ is our Savior. Christ is our Provider. Christ is our Redeemer. Christ is our hope. What an amazing thing that He allows us the privilege of knowing Him. He goes on to say, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then he goes on to say, that I may know him. That I may know him. You know, as, as we translate words from one language to another, we have to pick words that mean as close to the same as the other language as possible. Now, Greek is a very specific language. One example is the word love. We use the word love for lots of things. I love chocolate. I love my holiday in Scotland. I love coffee. I love my kids. I love my wife. But you know, in the Greek, there are three different words that are used for the one word that we use love. There is eros, which is the physical type of love. There is phileo, which is brotherly love. Uh, in America, we have a city, Philadelphia. It's called the city of brotherly love. And then we have God's type of love, which is agape, is an unconditional love. The other types of love are somewhat dependent upon the response of the person to whom you are loving. I don't love coffee that doesn't respond to me in a way that it tastes really good. Uh, I, I may have a, somebody that I'm acquainted with, but if they don't like me, I'm not going to say that I love them. When I met my wife, uh, 
you know, if she hadn't returned my affections, I eventually would have gotten over it and gone on. But this agape love is not dependent upon a response. For God so loved the world, <laughs> that's everybody, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Interestingly, we, we like to say that, uh, that everybody is, is a child of God. Are we not all children of God? John 1.12 says, Yet as many as received him, to those he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed on his name. We're all in creation, but only those who have received Christ are really his children. But that's not what I really want to focus on. What I want to focus on is the word to know. I, I met Graham this morning, and if somebody were to say to me outside, uh, you just came from that church, do you know Graham? And I would say, yes, I know Graham. I just met him. Or they might say, do you know Rick? Well, I met Rick by phone in the United States, but spent hours with him last night in just wonderful conversation. And, and I would say, yes, I know Rick. But I know Rick in a different way than I know Graham. I have a good friend at home that I've known for 30 or 40 years. His name is Larry. If somebody says, do you know Larry? I would say, oh, I know Larry. Yes. They, but you know what? I know my wife. I know my wife in a much more deep and intimate way than I know anybody else. In this passage, the Greek word, to know him, where Paul wants to know him, uh, someone once said, this verse could be said, that Paul could say, for my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. Let's break that apart. His determined purpose. I mean, that was what drove him. He said, I might know him. That I might progressively. It's ongoing. It's more and more. That I might pro progressively come to know him more deeply and intimately. Understanding the wonders of his person. We serve an infinite God. We are going to spend eternity with him in heaven. And yet, every day, not that there's time in heaven, but let's go with this for the sake of illustration, we're going to wake up and learn something more about God that we didn't know before. Day after day after year after year. Decades, centuries, billions of years we will still learn something more about God because he is an infinite God. And the day that we know everything about God, we will be God, and we will never be God. There will always be something more to learn about. We see through the Space Hubble telescope, we, we see some amazing things that we could never see before. <coughs> Billions of stars in billions of galaxies and beautiful nebulas. You know, see some beautiful things, go to NASA.com, and they'll show you some of these pictures. But I think God is saying, hey, I want you to build a better telescope because I've got even more things to show you. <coughs> and we have the opportunity to know him deeply and intimately and personally. But we are only as close to God as we choose to be. And so, how do we come to know him more deeply and intimately? The key <coughs> is prayer, which is us communicating with God, and his word, which is him communicating with us. And this is how God this is a love letter. 
This is a love letter to us telling us of his redemption plan from Genesis chapter 3. From the very beginning all the way to the end. And it's a love letter that tells us how much he loves us. But you know what? It's not just a love letter. This book is amazing. This collection of 66 books, written over 1,500 years by more than 66 authors on three continents, and yet there is a ribbon of continuity that runs all the way through it without error, without contradiction. If we find a contradiction in here, it's only in our understanding. It's not in the scripture itself. And this is how God speaks to us. And there's five ways that we can get this word into us. The first is hearing the word of God. Romans 10 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we can hear the word of God on Sunday morning through a sermon in a Bible study. Just through fellowshipping and talking about God. We hear the word of God as people preach and teach that to us. Secondly, is reading the word of God. First Peter says, we're like babies. And we should long for the pure milk of the word. That by it, we can grow. And so that's just reading. Then they're studying, 2 Timothy 2, <coughs> study to present, to present yourselves approved to God. As a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So studying is different than reading. We might read a book for enjoyment, and we can do that with God's word. But we also can read books to study and absorb and get deeper into them. Doing word studies, doing biography studies, all kinds of things that we can do. In this book, we can do a verse by verse study. We can do a chapter study. We can do a, a person study. There's lots of ways we can study this word, but we should be studying the word of God. Fourth, memorizing the word of God. David said, Lord, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, God told the Jews that they should write the scriptures on their doorposts, that they should wear on their clothing, that they should absorb the word of God in the morning when you first wake up, at night when you go to bed. We should be hiding God's word in our heart so that we have it with us. We never know when we're going to need the word of God. There was one lady who was captured. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. This story was years ago. But she, she was persecuted by the communists, I think it was. And, and she was put in a small 10-foot cell. But you know what? She had memorized the book of John. And so for the next two years, as she suffered in that cell, she walked around the world, she said. She said, I just walked and imagined that I was going all the way around the world. But I would read the word of John, the book of John, that I had memorized. And so she had God's word. And how about when you bump into somebody and, and you find an opportunity to share Christ with them? Well, what is more powerful, your words or God's words? And so if you've hidden God's word in your heart, you can bring that up. And the Holy Spirit will do that. They say, when you're under persecution, don't worry about what to say. I will give you the words to say. Well, he will give us the words because we have hidden them in our heart. And God will call them back to our memory. But the most important thing is to meditate on the word of God. Meditating on the word of God is where we turn it over in our mind. This is helpful if you've memorized the word of God because then you can meditate on the word of God while you're walking, while you're riding a bus. You can meditate on God's word. Joshua 1.8, 
God commands, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. It's a command. We should meditate on God's word. And I'm not talking about the Eastern type of emptying your mind. I'm talking about displacement, really. When we take God's word and we put it in our mind and we meditate on it, what we do is we fill our mind with God's word, which displaces all those things that should not be there. Paul wanted to know Christ deeply and intimately and personally. But the first step to this, of course, is receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can't know somebody you've never met. So how do we come to know Christ? Well, first, we have to admit the fact that we are sinners. That we have violated God's standard. That we have missed that mark. And that mark is perfection. He says, therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We have missed that mark of perfection. We serve a holy God. A holy God who has no imperfection, who has no error. And we fall short of that. When we recognize that, we confess that to God. Now, we're not telling God something he doesn't know. We're just agreeing with him. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not one. But you're on in chapter 3, Romans, it says, even our good works are as filthy rags to God. Wow. We confess that we're a sinner. We can't save ourselves. There's nothing that we can do. Secondly, we recognize that God is a loving God. First John 4, it says that God is love. But you know what? Exodus 34, 7 says, Yet I will not by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Okay, so he's a loving God. Just God, He's loving and doesn't want to punish us. He's a just God who must punish sin. How do these work together? How does He accomplish this? Well, He accomplishes it in the person of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? We already talked about. It. He's the infinite God man. He's all God and He's all man. The Bible says there is God on one side, there is man on the other, and in between is Jesus Christ. Who brings together God and man. Jesus Christ paid our penalty. What we deserve is death. Eternal separation from God. And there's only one place that that can happen, and that's in hell. God did not create hell for man. He created hell for the demons that rebelled against God. And some of them are there now, and some of them are not there yet. Satan does not rule in hell. Satan will be bound in hell one day, and he's not looking forward to that. The only joy that he has is taking as many of God's special people with him as possible. But God didn't desire that. He desires that we be with him for eternity. And so Jesus Christ paid our penalty. And when we receive Christ, remember that verse? Yet as many as received him, to those he gave the right to become children of God. But we have to receive him by faith. Now, there's different kinds of faith. There's a head knowledge. You know, just knowing something in your head. But the Bible says, you believe there's only one God? Well, great, but the demons believe that. There's trusting God for temporary things, health, travel. Uh, and we should trust God for those things. But saving faith is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. 
receiving him as Savior and Lord. Recognizing as Savior, he's the only one who can save you. You can't save yourself. Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. Krishna cannot save you. Only Jesus, he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But we have to receive him as Lord. To agree to make him the boss of our life. This doesn't mean that we're always going to be obedient. Rick, are your children always obedient? But they recognize you as father. They recognize your authority over them. And that you have the right to tell them what to do. Even if they don't always do it. And uh, that's okay. God covered that for us in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to purify us from all unrighteousness. We receive him as Savior and Lord. And we do it by faith. By grace you have been saved. Through faith. And that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not as a result of works. That no one should boast. What is the gift? It's grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. But God's unmerited favor is kind of a passive word. I think it goes beyond that. It's God's unmerited favor that results in the desire and the power to do God's will. When God gives us grace, he gives us the desire and the power to do his will. The Bible says, do not reject the grace of God. And so, if you do not know Jesus Christ, this king of the universe, this one who made this wonderful creation. And I want to let you know that you can do that. And you can do that today. You can say, Lord, I want you to come into my life. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I want you to be my personal Lord and Savior. If you feel the Holy Spirit moving in your heart, and this is something that you would like to do, then I would invite you after the service, or sometime this week, do not put it off, to talk with Brother Rick and let him know of your desire. We don't know the time that we have on this earth. And I want to encourage you, do not tarry. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father God, you are an amazing God. A God who, though you created everything and you have the power to, with a word, wipe everything out just as you created everything, with but a word. And yet you loved us so much that you were willing to go to the cross and suffer the excruciating death that you suffered. Not just the pain of the physical torment, but the weight of all of the sins of the world on your shoulders when you did this. And finally, you did it alone when the Father turned his back on you because he could not face sin. And you hung there on the cross for the first time in all eternity, separated from the Father and alone, bearing our sins. Thank you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just do this at this time. We're just going to have some music playing at this time. I just like everybody's heads bowed, and eyes closed. As the music's playing, I just want you to think of the sermon here that we've heard this afternoon and uh, how important it is for us to uh, uh, acknowledge the truths in God's Word. Do you know Him? He gives us the privilege of getting to know Him by His Word. Many of us desire to know God, but we don't want to take the effort involved in, in getting a hold of the Word of God and, and getting to know Him. We don't want to take time out of our schedule to pray, to talk to Him. Uh, church becomes an inconvenience because it's just something that's uh, impeding in our lives and keeping us from doing things that we would consider fun. We need to make a decision today, something that would honor and glorify God. And that is to put Him first in our lives. 
Maybe the struggle in putting him first in your life is because maybe you, you haven't made that decision to be saved. Making a decision for Christ, this, is, this, is, this starts a whole new life for you. Before it was based all on self and trying to do things on your own. But what God gives us in his word is that he's done it all. It's done in him. He just wants you to look at what he's done and believe for whosoever shall believe. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never made a decision for salvation, what's stopping you? If today is the day of salvation, then would you make the decision today to trust Christ as your personal Savior? Maybe you need someone to talk to you about it more. If that's something that's on your heart right now, and that's something you'd like to get settled today, would you, by raise of hand, raise your hand and say, you know what, I'd like to talk with somebody about this. I'd like to get this settled today. If the decision is still pending in your heart, I ask that you wouldn't delay. You would get it settled as soon as possible. If something you'd like to talk to us about after the service or in this week, let us know. It's one of the best decisions you can ever make. Can I ask one more question? And that is for those that do know Christ as their Savior. The challenge that was given today is about knowing God. Have we been struggling in that area? Have we just thought, well, I know enough about God. I know enough to get me by. But is it as important as it was to Paul that he was determined by all means to get to know him? Do we have that desire in our heart? If that desire is there, then why not fulfill it and go in that direction to get to know him? Separating our, our, uh, our understanding of Christ in society today is what everybody does. This is why the world is so backwards. But when was the last time we actually made God a priority? And every decision we made, we've said, is this please God? Or is this something that pleases my desire? When someone says, well, I just choose to do things my own way, I separate all this because it's for the greater good. But when was the last time we took Christ out of something and said it was the greater good? Is that the decision we ought to make? Putting Christ first, knowing him, and he's done so much for us. Why reject it? At this time, we'll go ahead and have our invitational hymn. I ask that you would just stand with us. If you're in the spirit of prayer, remain seated uh, during this portion. But if you'd like to sing with us, hymn number 308, we will sing, Have You Any Room for Jesus? Hymn number 308.
thank you, everybody. Uh, a last minute announcement. For those who are within the, the choir, the church choir, we are meeting afterwards after some tea and refreshments by the piano after service today. If you are not, but you would like to see how it is, you're more than welcome to listen in. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, and you guys are dismissed. Thank you.